Hi everyone, this is Dr. Tom Garcia. I'm going to be a co-presenter on this webcast entitled Arrhythmia Recognition, the Art of Education. Okay, it's funny. My son just suggested that we need to have a blooper section at the end of this uh, webcast because some of the stuff we have to go back over and fix is really hilarious. But in this section, we're actually going to have some fun stuff. This is where we're going to put it all together. We're going to be giving you an unknown, and then you're going to start applying logical thought to arrive at the correct diagnosis. At first, it may seem a little overwhelming. It could be a little mess because you really haven't been used to working with mechanisms to really cause the interpretations. For those of you that have used mechanisms for interpretation, it'll be a heck of a lot easier for you. But it's still a very challenging EKG, and I think you're going to get a real kick out of it. Just as an FYI, this is a really rare case, but it does occur in clinical practice. I just thought you'd be interested in it, and, and it would give you a good exercise in the practice of putting mechanisms to work for you. As a side note, my son actually figured this strip out fairly quickly. I was completely blown away by the fact that he was able to figure out such a complex thought. And he explained to me, well... The mechanisms follow, and I just followed the mechanisms, and I got the right answer. Not bad for 10 hours of education and reading a book. So this is the unknown. I'm going to give you a few seconds to look at it. If you need some more time, just put the, the webcast on pause. Take a look at it all you want. Do your measurements. Do whatever you need to do, and then come back in and just restart it whenever you're ready. Okay, remember how in the guidelines section we stress putting the strip together with information, total information, like the history, physical exam, whatever, to make a diagnosis? That would make this a little bit easier. So I just figured I'm going to not tell you that stuff because, first of all, it really wouldn't add that much information to you, but it just gives you a little extra challenge. And you guys are instructors, so, you know, let's, let's get serious. I got to challenge you because otherwise you wouldn't get a kick out of it. Okay, so is it aberrancy? Is it a different rhythm or is it a figment of your imagination? Okay, let me give you the answer. Did that help you out in any way? Well, yeah, kind of. It told us that it was basically normal sinus rhythm with aberrancy. But did it help you learn anything? Did it teach you anything about the pathology underlying the strip? No. It is the correct answer, but just not why it's the correct answer. It's not the total answer. Let's put it that way. So it's aberrancy. Or is it? Okay, we really need to go through the steps to figure out whether this is aberrancy. So let's go back to the beginning. How does aberrancy form? Let's start off by using an analogy. Remember at the beginning of the last section, I talked about how analogies are really forceful and really, really informative to try to get some information across? This is one of them. Now, before we get started, I want you to understand that electricity and water have very common properties. They both fill in every gap, and they take the course of least resistance. That's a couple of them that we're going to be talking about here. For now, let's talk about water, because it's simpler for us to understand the concept of water rather than, than electricity. So in this case, you have a nice riverbed, and water's traveling down the riverbed because that's the path of least resistance and it's traveling down just as the in a conduction system, you'd have a normal P wave, PR interval, AV nodal stimulation, and the slowing effect, and it travels through the Purkinje system, and then poof, you got the depolarization, and then you repolarize. Nice, smooth transition through everything. Nice, relaxing flow. Now, suppose you had a drought, and then you had a giant thunderstorm. And that thunderstorm dropped a lot of water. And then you have this giant flash flood. All that water is going to take the path of least resistance. And the path of least resistance is the dry riverbed. So now it's coming down the dry riverbed. And let's just add another little variable in there. Let's put a beaver dam right in the middle of that sucker. So the water's traveling down. It's going to hit that beaver dam. What do you think is going to happen? Well, the water has one of two options. It can either break through the beaver dam which means I couldn't use it as an analogy, or it would overflow. And then it just, by overflowing, it tries to fill in every gap, and it tries to take the new course of least resistance. 
So that's what occurs in aberrancy. You have basically an electrical conduction, an electrical impulse that travels down, and once it hits a particular block, it starts traveling aberrantly from that point on. And transmission occurs by direct cell-to-cell -cell depolarization. Now, it just so happens that the right bundle branch block has the, the longest refractory period, which means that anything that comes out of a little earlier or a little sooner could immediately trigger off an aberrant complex because it gets to a point and it gets blocked. From that block, the direct cell-to-cell -cell transmission would occur. So if the block occurs sooner along the right bundle branch block, right after the bifurcation, you'd get a lot of aberrancy. If it happens very late, you'd get a much smaller level of aberrancy. Now, what that block does is it causes that direct-to-cell transmission, as we said. That wave forms a vector that is completely unopposed. And that unopposed vector comes out on the EKG in the terminal 0.04 seconds of the QRS complex. It accounts for the slurring of the S wave in leads 1 and V6, and it occurs for the R prime in V1, okay, which gives you the rabbit ear appearance of RS R prime. It also accounts for the depolarization abnormalities that occur in the ST segments and the T waves, because if it depolarizes by aberrancy, it has to repolarize aberrantly. So you're going to get the different variations on the morphological appearance of the QRS complex. Okay, that's what happens during that cycle. Now, I want you to understand a very important thing. Notice that the aberrancy in most of these cases occur during conduction through the right bundle branch. That means that the PR interval is completely normal. What occurred in the SA node, the internodal pathways, direct atrial transmission, the AV node, all that is included in the PR interval. So if that's included in the PR interval, that is unchanged. So normal rate-related aberrancy gives you a normal PR interval unless it's associated with a PAC or a PJC that's triggered off the premature complex. Okay, so do you see any PACs in our strip? When you look at our strips, we see that the P to P interval is exactly metronome quality. It is dead on the money. There's no premature complexes involved there. So if there's no premature complexes, what accounts for the aberrancy? That's an interesting concept. Now, Fish, in the article he published in Circulation in 1973, stated that the rate-related changes could be so small, they could be so minimal, that you can't really pick it up on a surface EKG. You can only pick it up by EPS studies. Is that what's happening here? I really... I really doubt that, considering that my newbie arrhythmia son was able to pick it up very quickly, was able to diagnose this very quickly. And I know he doesn't read, you know, articles from 1973 circulation, only his nerd father reads that stuff. Now, if you notice the last four complexes, those are the aberrantly transmitted impulses. If those are aberrant, what's the PR interval in those cases? The PR interval is shortened. Didn't we just finish saying that the PR interval will be normal in a rate-related aberrancy? Yeah. So why are they there? That's the question. So is it aberrancy? I don't think so. Bottom line is we don't have an answer to why the PR intervals are shorter in those cases. Now, I do want to give you guys a clinical pearl, though. Whenever you look at a rhythm strip, you should always tell your students to make sure that they measure all the intervals. Measure the PR, the QRS interval, the QT intervals. Measure the P to P intervals, the R to R intervals. Measure all that stuff. If there's an abnormality in those intervals, that's probably where the money lies. Now, if you have a 12 lead ECG, the answer is even simpler. Because if you have a 12 lead ECG, always remember that the longest interval is the one that's the true measurement. Because depending on which lead it's in, you have isoelectric segments throughout it. It could be the beginning, it could be at the end, it could be all over the place. But the longest interval is the one that it takes into account those isoelectric segments that you can't see in the other ones. All right, so keep that in mind. So I see your mind starting to go into an overdrive. You've got these blurry thoughts starting to emerge. And all of a sudden, you say to yourself, could this be an accessory pathway.
Well, let's take a look at accessory pathways. Starting off with accessory pathway number one, we talk about Langenang Levine syndrome, or what's known as LGL syndrome, to make it simpler for everybody who doesn't know how to say Ganang. So Langenang Levine syndrome is a syndrome where you have a shortened PR interval, but the QRS complex is normal, the P wave appears normal, and there's no arrhythmogenic potential to cause a more serious arrhythmia. It's just a shortened PR interval for no reason whatsoever. Originally, they thought it was something that was called the James fibers, which were these little fibers that either went from the atria to the distal AV node or from the earlier part of the AV node to the later part of the AV node. And by doing that, it basically jumped over the physiologic block of the AV node. It shortened that section. And by shortening that section, you have shorter PR intervals. Now, modern EPS studies have shown that James fibers don't exist. And what is actually happening is that the AV node has faster conduction and a shorter physiologic block. Note that the ECG changes still exist. It's, however, non-intermittent, and there should be no formation of a sudden right bundle branch block. I guess we should call it now the LGL pattern instead of an LGL syndrome since James fibers have gone bye-bye. Okay, now let's take a look at other accessory pathways. The other accessory pathway could form anywhere within the atrioventricular septum. Depending on the distance between the AV node and the accessory pathway, you will have different levels of transmission through the bypass track, giving rise to either more of a delta wave because of the slowing and there's more cell-to-cell -cell depolarization, or it could be shorter and you'd have less amounts of a delta wave. So that's why approximately 7% of WPW pattern actually doesn't have a really truly significant PR shortening. In these particular cases of accessory pathway, the impulse travels down from the atria. It hits the AV node and the accessory pathway at approximately the same time. And the transmission spreads through both of them. But remember, the AV node has a physiologic block, and that physiologic block causes a slowing effect, which later on triggers off the electrical conduction system, and it causes most of the muscle of the myocardium to depolarize at one second. If it goes to the accessory pathway, however, it goes through much quicker. There's no physiologic block whatsoever. There's no slowing down of anything in any way, shape, or form. And once it hits that ventricular myocardium, it starts spreading by slow cell-to-cell -cell contact. So it gives rise to a slow waveform, which proceeds concentrically from where the opening is in the ventricle for the accessory pathway. Now, let's take a look at them in real time. Now that leads us to two different kinds of variations of arrhythmogenic potential. Take a look at the first one. This is, this is the kind of arrhythmia that forms when the original depolarization wave comes down and travels through the physiologic block. Now the accessory pathways nearby or conditions are just right so that it starts going retrogradely up the accessory pathway. Remember, the accessory pathway has no block either in one direction or the other. So it transfers rack up there really quickly. But when it hits the atria, the atrial myocardium is not in a refractory state. So it travels over through whatever pathway it can find because electricity always finds a way until it gets back to the AV node and a circus movement is formed. That circus movement will give you rise to a QRS complex that's narrow because it still travels down the electrical conduction system to trigger off most of ventricular myocardium. So the good thing about this particular type of um, arrhythmia is that it has a limited potential for speed. It has a certain rate that it cannot really go beyond. And that rate depends on the AV node because it is slowed down by the physiologic block. This is a type of arrhythmia called orthodromic AV reentry tachycardia. 
Now the AV reentry tachycardia comes in because it involves the AV node and it involves a reentry circuit that goes backwards through the accessory pathway. Orthodromic means it's going forward through the AV node and then coming retrogradely up the accessory pathway. So that is once again orthodromic AVRT. Now let's take a look at them in real time. This other rhythm, on the other hand, is AVRT as well, because it also involves the AV node and the accessory pathway. But this time, the original depolarization wave from the atrial myocardium went in through the accessory pathway first. It started to spread by direct cell-to-cell -cell contact, and it eventually hits the AV node. Once it hits the AV node, it travels retrogradely up the AV node. And remember, there is no physiologic block at the AV node if, it, if an impulse is going retrogradely from the ventricles to the atria. So it travels very quickly down the accessory pathway, goes across the myocardium, and travels very quickly through the AV node to the atrial myocardium, where it triggers off another circus movement. But this time, there is no physiologic block involved. These arrhythmias can get very, very fast and it leads to a lot of very serious complications. Now, let's take a look at them in real time. Remember the case we were talking about before about atrial flutter and somebody with Wolf-Parkinson-White pattern? That's exactly what occurred in this patient. The patient that we were talking about had an atrial flutter with a, a flutter wave of 300 beats per minute, and it had a ventricular response of 150. So when it traveled down the physiologic block in an orthodromic picture, it would allow the ventricles to only fire off at 150 beats per minute. That is the purpose of the AV node, to slow down the super fast atrial rhythm. But in an antidromic conduction, and once it got to 300, it overrode the AV node. The AV node could no longer keep up with it. And it went down the accessory pathway and back up the AV node. And that formed an antidromic AVRT. That's what this type of is called antidromic AVRT. Is there an accessory pathway in this case? Well, we just finished talking about it, and basically we don't have anything that's either LGL or AVRT in any kind of presentation here. So it doesn't really match either of the two, and we don't really see a serious accessory pathway occurring here. But that's not quite true. There, there's another thing that we have to look at. Let's go back and review a simple thing which we probably completely forgot about. Is there another way that a circus movement can form around the AV area, about the AV nodal area? Well, yeah, it's our old buddy AV nodal reentry tachycardia. Now, if you remember, AV nodal reentry tachycardia happens when you have two pathways leading to the AV node. You have a fast pathway and a slow pathway. We'll get to that in a second. But the way I like to look at it, going back to my water analogy, is now you have a nice, comfortable river, and it's headed down, and it's very smooth, and then it hits an island. And when it hits an island, it has to bifurcate. And after the bifurcation, you have one pathway that has turbulent flow and one pathway that has laminar flow. Let's change the orientation of this to really match the actual double pathway entry to the AV node in AVNRT patients. Okay, now we do it this way. Now we have two of them going into one. And that's almost the same kind of flow, and that's what I want you to keep in mind, except it's just going in reverse compared to the first picture. So the faster of the two is laminar flow. So when we look at our dry riverbed concept, now we have the flash flood. 
Okay, the flash flood comes to this dry riverbed that has a lot of rocks and a lot of junk in it, and then it has one area that has a deep channel. It catches the water in this little pool, and then from there it goes off somewhere else. So the flow starts coming down. Once it gets to the bifurcation that's there because of the island, it'll start either going down the, the turbulent flow area or down the laminar flow area, either through the fast pathway or through the slow pathway. Which one's it going to take? Well, by common sense, it would start heading down the fast pathway much faster than it would start heading down the slow pathway. So it travels down faster and more water goes through, and you fill up that little pool a lot quicker. And then it starts flowing retrogradely back up the pathway that has all the rocks and all the turbulent flow in it. Until eventually, they both hit. And when they hit each other, they cancel out. And then even though conduction is still continuing in a slow pathway going forward, they're both feeding the main area down here. Just one is very slow and the other one's very quick. That's the way the dual pathway works. Now, every once in a while, a tree falls down and blocks the fast pathway. So what happens when the flow hits that tree? It stops. So now you have a river flowing that has a fast pathway but is blocked and then it has a slow pathway in that case the flow that actually exists is through the slow pathway and it'll travel down that slow pathway fill up the pool and then begin going retrograde just because it's trying to fill up the space in the fast pathway now let's take a look at that concept which is pretty easy to understand when you think about it like a river and put it towards the av node the AV node in these patients has, as I mentioned before, two entry pathways into it. One is called the fast or beta pathway, and it's the anterior superior approach. And the other one's called the slow or alpha pathway, and that's the posterior inferior approach if you look at it anatomically. They both hit the AV node, and then from there, they travel on down through the His bundle and trigger everything off underneath it. Now, what happens to these patients when an impulse comes down? Well, the impulse starts traveling, starts traveling down the, from the atria, and eventually it's going to hit both of those entry pathways at its opening. Naturally, it's going to travel down the fast pathway faster. It's going to travel down a slower pathway slower. Now, the one thing I want to mention is the fast pathway has a very slow refractory period. In other words, it transmits the impulse very quickly, but it takes a very long time for it to reset. Okay, the slow pathway transmits it slower, but resets very quickly. So that's the properties of those that could trigger off a circus movement. One would be the equivalent of a turbulent flow, the other would be equivalent of a laminar flow. Okay, now the impulse comes down, it hits the fast channel travels preferentially down the fast channel and starts it triggers off the av node and then starts heading up retrogradely up the slow pathway the impulse is traveling down a slow pathway crashes into that one and they both kind of stop at that particular point so in most cases in these patients the impulse is transmitted through the fast pathway now let's take a look at what that actually looks like in actual motion Every once in a while, however, as we mentioned, the fast pathway is refractory and it doesn't travel down that pathway. And these patients actually have a very interesting conduction system. Now, along comes a premature atrial contraction. When the premature atrial contraction comes down and hits those two openings for those tracks, which one's going to be available to it? Well, the fast pathway, since it is a premature complex, is refractory. The transmission down that pathway. In the slow pathway, it will travel very slowly, but it will be open to it, and it'll eventually get to the AV node, and then from there, it'll travel retrogradely up the fast pathway. So the PAC kind of starts a slow pathway that travels down 
and then starts retrogradely backwards. By that time, the fast pathway is already over its refractory period and can transmit the impulse again. And that forms a circus movement, which continuously goes down to slow, up the fast, down to slow, up the fast. Each one of those triggering off the AV node and triggering off a tachycardic rhythm. Now let's take a look at what that actually looks like in actual motion. Okay, that's the way typical AV nodal reentry tachycardia pattern is formed. We're not going to talk about a typical pattern here, but there's also an atypical form of AV NRT. You can look that up in my book if you're interested, or in any other book if you could try to find the data. So what does that have to do with our strip? Well, when we look at our strip, the first three impulses have a long PR interval, but the QRSs are nice and tight. The last four complexes have a shortened PR interval, and they're conducted in a right bundle branch or a barrent pattern. So does that make any sense now that we've gone through AVNRT? Yeah, it does. And what happens is as it travels down the slow pathway, which occurs in the first three complexes in the rhythm strip, it takes a long time to get to the AV node, and then when it triggers it, it triggers a nice tight QRS complex. When it travels down the fast pathway, it arrives faster at the right bundle branch block. That little, just that little insignificant change. Remember, Fish talked about in the circulation article that it takes just very little amounts, sometimes even unrecognizable amounts on the surface electrocardiogram. In this case, that's a significant shortening of the PR interval. So when it travels down that fast pathway, it could trigger off an aberrant complex, and that's exactly what's occurring there. So you have dual conduction through the pathway. The impulse is normal because it's all from a sinus node. But when it hits that pathway, depending on which pathway it takes, it'll choose one or the other. When it chooses the fast pathway, it gives you the short PR interval, and that causes the aberrancy. When it travels down the, the slow pathway, it doesn't catch the right bundle in the refractory period, and it doesn't cause an aberrant conduction. That's the answer to our unknown. It's a pretty cool case, and it's not something you're going to commonly see, but it's a very cool case. All right, so let's take a look at the lessons we've learned. The lessons we covered in this, just reviewing this one strip, which really took very few minutes, is number one. We talked about aberrancy. We talked about right bundle branch patterns and how they were formed. We talked about how the location of the aberrancy alters morphology. We talked about how PR intervals are affected by dual pathways in a navy node. We talked about the need to measure all intervals. We talked about accessory pathways, including Lounganang-Levine syndrome, including LGL and AVRT. We talked about antidromic and orthodromic AVRT, which, by the way, are covered in your national guidelines. We talked about the need to classify the correct rhythm that you're dealing with. We talked about rate-related aberrancy that doesn't need change or minimal amounts of change in order to cause an aberrant pattern. We went over the mechanisms of AVNRT, and most importantly, we learned that all strips are clinically relevant. Every EKG strip will teach you something if you really pay attention to it. There's some little minute point, and that little minute point is where the money lies. They're gold mines of information. It's all in how you approach them. If there's anything out of the ordinary, bite into it and don't let go. You need to be a bulldog. Daniel, why'd you put this cute little puppy? I asked you to put that ugly bulldog. You know, the one with the spike collars and the 
big teeth and the slobber dripping off his jowls. Man, you put this little puppy dog. I mean, it's... Anyway. Final thoughts. Approach your profession with pride, efficiency, ingenuity, and professionalism. Never give in to the easy route. And constantly strive to find better and simpler ways to get your point across to your students. Elevate and inspire your students, and they, in turn, will elevate and inspire you. Okay? Remember that those who can do, those who can't teach, is not the right answer. The right answer is those who can do, those who teach, do it a lot better. Now, since we're on corny uh, cliches, let's give you another one. Give a man a fish and you feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish and you feed him for a lifetime. Maimonides said that, and it's really one of the best sayings I've ever heard for general impression. But for electrocardiography, a great man by the name of Garcia once said, give a man a strip and you teach him a new pattern. Teach a man a mechanism and you teach him for a lifetime. Giving students a false sense of understanding is a disservice to your student and their patients. If you know the mechanisms, you feed them for a lifetime. There's no such thing as wasted knowledge. When you meet someone, give them the respect they deserve. Learn what you can from them and assimilate what you need and discard the rest. That's something you should do with this lecture as well as anything else. You've heard my approach. You've heard my story. You can either take it or leave it. That's adult education. That's all there is to it. Okay, my philosophy on life is very simple. When you throw a stone into a nice flat pond, you start creating ripples. And those ripples start spreading concentrically outwards until they reach the other side and then they start bouncing back again. So after a while, you have a whole mishmash of ripples all over the place. Well, mankind is a lot of people along the edges of that pond throwing ripples inside it. Your ripples will touch everybody else's ripples around you. Teaching creates ripples. Those ripples reach out in ways you can't even dream. Ego shouldn't be an issue for any educator because your ripples are so broad and so powerful that you're literally changing the future of the world. The reason is that every student you teach touches directly or indirectly hundreds, if not thousands, of lives. They usually teach someone as well. And they, in turn, cause ripples. And those ripples are attached to your ripples. Bottom line is, you touch thousands to millions of ripples by the end of your life. We are the descendants of ripples cast by our parents, teachers, and friends. We are the ripples of each person we have contacted, either directly or indirectly, in our life. Every producer of an educational show, every writer who triggers off our ingenuity or our thoughts, every poem that we read... Those leaders, those teachers who took us to the outer edges of imagination, we are their ripples. So why are we doing this webcast? To make ripples. We thank you for your participation in the webcast from the bottom of our heart. I hope you've gotten something out of it and something that you could pass on to your students. If you have any questions or if you have any feedback, I'm going to give you the the email where you can send the information to. I'll try to answer each and every one of those as fast as I can. It may take a little longer depending on how many times you write, but I really would appreciate some feedback. And I have a little decision tree here that I want you guys to follow. If the feedback is positive, send me the email to that address. If the email is negative, just uh, do what it tells you to do there. And if you have any questions, please contact me directly and either myself or Daniel will be happy to answer it depending on who you address it to. Thanks a million.